Hi, this is John. This video is slightly different. It's not on construction per se, but about shop safety. We'll talk about various hazards involved in high power rocketry materials and building techniques and how to get good results while still minimizing health risks. Messy workspaces are a hazard. We'll talk about how cleanliness and preparation produce better results and safer working conditions. Hobby knives are a very common tool. A few simple techniques will give you better results and more safety. Certain kinds of dust, aside from causing a mess, can be toxic. We'll talk about ways to minimize the risk. Epoxy is the premier bonding material in high power rocketry. We'll talk about issues with sensitization and how to protect yourself. And finally, whether you're building model rockets or high power rockets, you'll need to be careful with ancillary chemicals and paint. I suppose a messy workspace isn't a traditional hazard. However, a clean workspace is much more pleasant to work in and will help you produce better results. Spend a little time at the end or the beginning of each work session and make some space for yourself. If, you're tr if you have a messy area and you're trying to balance things, it's just going to be harder to do everything. You're going to drop things. Things aren't going to come out right. A little bit of cleanup and a little bit of planning will really pay you back. I go into more detail in my epoxy video, but even something simple like a drip tray helps keep your epoxy mixing area clean and it's easy to switch out if it gets too messy. It's hard to get good results if your work surface is covered with epoxy drips or everything stuck together with CA. So I like to protect surfaces with butcher paper, comes on convenient rolls, and for small jobs, just pull out a piece of wax paper. Cover your immediate work area, then you can perform your bonding, and then you can throw it away, keeping your surface nice and clean. If you're like me and tend to have multiple projects going on at the same time, make sure that each project is boxed together so that when you're not working on it, the stuff stays organized, and most importantly, the rockets you're not working on in that building session don't get in the way of the ones that you are working on. Let's talk about knives. This is a hobby knife made by Exacto, and these are great little tools, go-to for everything from opening a box to cutting out fins. So I have my knife, replacement blades, and a cutting surface. Now, one of the things that people don't always realize is that the sharper the blade, the safer the tool. You should always cut with a sharp blade, partly because you get better results and partly because you don't have to apply so much force so there's less chance of things going wrong. If you're not sure when the last time you changed your blade was, or if you know you cut something that caused it to dull, just change it. New blades are cheap. No reason to fight with a dull blade. Before I throw the old blades away, I like to wrap them in a little bit of masking tape so they don't cut anything. Always start any new job with a fresh blade and things will go smoother and more easily. Whenever we're going to cut, we have our sharp blade. We want to cut against a straight edge if at all possible. And we don't want to cut towards our other hand. I'm right-handed, so I'll hold the rule with my left and guide the knife with my right. You want to guide the knife along the straight edge in a series of shallow cuts. Don't try to cut all the way through in one go. You'll just make a mess. You want to slice through the material in this case, with balsa, you want to cut the fibers rather than crushing them. This will give us a nice clean edge. So even though this is quite a thick piece of balsa, 
we have a nice clean cut all the way through with minimal effort by using a sharp knife, many passes with moderate pressure. Sharp hobby knives work really well for trimming off excess fiberglass lamination as well. But again, always cut away from you and hold the blade as flat to the surface as possible. If you angle it down like this, you'll dig in. If you hold it flat, you'll skate along the surface. Again, if you find it takes too much effort, switch the blade or take lighter passes. In the case of fiberglass, if you do the trimming while the fiberglass is still at the green stage, not fully cured, it's a lot easier. And obviously you don't want to have sharp knives laying around in a drawer or in a bin where you can stab yourself. So at the end of a work session, get in the habit either of discarding the blade or capping the knife. Typical woodworking sawdust is not that harmful. The particles are large and the material itself is not toxic. However, some dust is worse than this. Composite materials such as fiberglass and carbon fiber do produce nasty dust. The problem is that sawing, and even more so sanding, produces superfine particles that get down into your lungs and can't be removed through normal mechanisms. High levels of exposure to this can cause silicosis or miner's lung, which is something you want to avoid. So working with composites, you're just going to be exposed to dust. So the best thing to do is minimize your exposure. There are two ways to do that. One, and definitely the best method, is to collect the dust at the point of production. Typically, this means using a vacuum. You should use a vacuum that has a HEPA filter and you should collect the dust immediately as it's being produced. This super fine dust will stay in the air for a long time, even after the operation is done, so you want to collect it immediately. Another possibility is to use a tile saw. The advantage here is these cut wet, so water washes away the dust, collecting it as a sludge, which is much easier to dispose of. I put together a page on how to use this to cut tubes. The next thing you can do is try to prevent breathing in whatever particles escape from your vacuum system. This is usually done with dust mask or respirator. I include the dust mask just because people use them so often, but I actually don't think they give you much benefit. For one thing, the filter isn't very fine, and for another thing, the air can easily get past it, so then you're breathing the materials you're trying to keep out. A step up is a cartridge respirator. This is much better for two reasons. One is the cartridges are replaceable, so you can pick the cartridge most appropriate for the material you're trying to protect against and they'll work against fumes from solvents and paints as well. The other thing is they're made to fit tight against your face so air doesn't get in through the sides. The major problem with cartridge respirators is that they're uncomfortable. The best solution in my opinion, although unfortunately also the most expensive, is a PAPR system. What this does is filter the air and again you have a choice of different filtering cartridges and blow it past your face. So you have a full face helmet, you can see what you're doing, but yet you're not breathing in any air because it's filtered, and you have air washing past your face so no fumes get in. It's actually a very nice system. It doesn't decrease mobility too much because the filter unit straps to your belt. So for mid-power and high-power rocketry, epoxy is an essential material. For general purpose bonding, you use some sort of bonding epoxy. For lamination, you'll use laminating epoxy. And whether you're using a basic hobby shop epoxy, or general epoxy system, or some exotic high temperature material, you're going to be dealing with epoxy and the chemicals they contain. Hopefully by now everybody knows to wear gloves, such as these nitrile gloves, to keep it off your skin. But it's also important to consider whether or not you want to breathe the fumes. As far as actual toxicity of chemicals, 
the manufacturer's safety data sheet that comes with your epoxy system will give you some information. However, these can be hard to read. The main thing to remember is that most epoxies contain isocyanates, and while these aren't strongly toxic in themselves, they do cause allergic sensitization over time. What this means is that slowly your body will build up a reaction to them which can get extreme. So it's probably good to be careful about your exposure, not only through the skin, but also breathing. So if I'm mixing up a small amount of bonding epoxy, I'll pretty much not worry about it. But if I'm doing a large batch of laminating epoxy or any other prolonged exposure, I'll go ahead and wear my respirator just to be safe. And lastly, we come to solvents. Many of these solvents, such as acetone and paint thinner, are used for cleaning, and paint also contains various solvents. Some solvents, such as acetone, are pretty well known. There are other, even nastier solvents, such as xylene and toluene, which appear in various products that you might not expect, including paint and filler, such as this putty. These chemicals are extremely strong. You need to protect them from your skin, and you also want to minimize the amount you breathe. They can cause short-term damage, nausea, dizziness. They can cause long-term damage as carcinogens. Volatile organic compounds, very important to protect yourself against. Obviously, you want to use a paint booth if you can, but even if you have to paint outdoors, always wear your respirator. So when working with solvents, be careful. Try using alcohol instead of a VOC solvent like acetone. And if you're going to work with stronger solvents, such as toluene or xylene, use respirator. Particularly with painting, a respirator will be your friend to protect your lungs. At least use a cartridge respirator and make sure it's properly fit. I'm sorry this video is more of a downer than most of them, but I think these are issues that are important to be concerned with and at least recognize your exposure. Have fun in the shop and stay healthy.